Hi, friends. How you guys doing? It's been a while. My mom says hi. <laughs> Last year, actually, on Mother's Sunday, I brought her here at HTV, so she sends her regards. I would love to start us off by praying. So let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have already been moving in this place. And God, we are so expectant for more. We pray that you will come and pierce our hearts. We pray that it won't be about us, it won't be about me. But God, ultimately, we pray that we will have a fresh encounter with you. So Holy Spirit, come and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to tell you about one of my favorite restaurants, which is in East London. I first heard about this restaurant because my sister came to me one day last year. She said, Wale, I want to take you out for dinner. And I said, oh, how amazing. Well, if you want to spend your money on me, I'm definitely not going to complain. And I said to her, I said, you know, where are we going? And she said, don't worry. The thing is, my sister is a lawyer, and she's a lawyer with impeccable taste. She literally has her own food blog. And my sister is what I call a bougie foodie. And I thought my sister was going to take me to a Michelin star restaurant. But to my horror, we arrived outside down, we arrived outside a run-down restaurant, a run-down takeaway place. This place was so ghetto. It, <laughs> honestly, this place was dimly lit, flickering signs. There was letters missing out from their menu. And I said, sis, why have you forsaken me? She said, Walla, you're so dramatic. I said, no. I said, you want to kill me. What did I do to you? Let me know so I can repent right here, right now. And she said, Wally, trust me. And I said, I don't. That's the thing. <laughs> but she grabbed my hand and she dragged me into the restaurant and she made her order. And the, even the interior of the place didn't help. Chairs were off its hinges. And the person, the, the lady behind the counter, she wasn't vibing with me. You know, we didn't have the same rapport as my local boss man. I don't know your name, but I know everything else about you. But auntie behind the counter didn't give me the same energy. So when it came to the food, I had little expectations. But friends, when the food came, when I tasted that chicken and rice, I turned to my sister and I said, I think this is one of the best things I have ever tasted. And she said, you see, I've got you, bro. The space, the flavoring, I honestly couldn't believe it. And there was a time literally last year where I used to go to this place every single week. And there may be some of you here in person and online, you may think that the best place to eat is on Kensington High Street. I'm here to tell you that you are wrong. You have to go to ends, you have to go through some alleyways and find that place that looks run down because that is where you will taste the true wonders of the world. Amen? <laughs> Amen. And just like I never expected anything good to come from that restaurant, in Matthew chapter 5, which is our anchor text for today, Jesus is speaking to a group of people that others would, that others would have expected nothing good to come out of them. Matthew 4, the previous chapter, tells us that Jesus is speaking to a group of fishermen. He's speaking to a group of sick people. He's speaking to a group of tormented people and those who are struggling financially. These people start following Jesus. These people are unimportant and insignificant. They were marginalized, rejected by Roman, by Roman society, and they were oppressed under the elite. And Matthew 5, Jesus is speaking to a group of people that others would have called losers. And as he speaks to them, the first words that he says to them is that they are blessed. Specifically, he says these words. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As you can see, the repeated word throughout this text is blessed. And in ancient Greek, the word for blessed is makarios, which literally means happy. How fortunate are you? It's like saying to someone, you have made it. And if this is the case, these are quite unusual scenarios for Jesus to describe as fortunate. I want you to imagine you ask someone, how are you doing today? And they said these words to you. I'm poor in spirit. I'm mourning. I'm meek. I'm persecuted. These men behind me are busy insulting me. You wouldn't say these individuals, you wouldn't say that person is blessed. You would say they are having a crisis. The connotations of these scenarios do not scream winning, but Jesus changes the optics of these terms. So let's break down what he means. In verse 3, it starts off by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Greek word for poor is patotos, which literally means extreme poverty. It refers to the type of poverty where you have nothing. You have nothing going for you. You have nothing to your name, and you can't survive without the help of other people. You are completely dependent on others. And Jesus is saying, blessed are those who do not pride themselves in their own ability, who do not pride themselves in their own strength, in their own creativity, who can't find anything of themselves. Blessed are those who are not self-assured and self-reliant. And in a world that celebrates self-sufficiency, in a world that says, I don't need anyone else, I don't even need God, blessed are those who realize that they are nothing without God. Blessed are those who understand that they can't earn a relationship with God. They can't earn his love, his forgiveness, his provision, answered prayer, and even salvation based on their own merit, based on their own performance, but only based by the sheer and rich mercy of God's generosity and mercy. And the person that acknowledges their poverty before God, that that acknowledges that I am nothing without God, Jesus says that theirs is the kingdom. Jesus says that these will be the people who will receive an inheritance from him. But the person that has too much pride, perhaps in their own moral compass or perhaps in their own wealth and status, cannot receive anything from God. Because as we know, the kingdom flows to lowly places. And let's go on. Let's go to verses four and six. I will do those together because they relate to one another. In verses four, it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those, in verse six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be healed. You see, Jesus here is not talking about a mourning over a a loved one, a, a loved one that had passed away. He's not talking about mourning over physical death. He's talking about a mourning over our own sin and the sin in the world and the effects of it. And I'm sure many of us can relate to this. You know that feeling when you know you've really done something wrong. It's that feeling of deep grief and sorrow within you because of what you have done or or perhaps because of what others have done. And maybe you know someone else in your world. You are grieved because it looks like they are going off the rails. You are grieved by the sense of the trajectory of their lives are going completely in the wrong direction. And maybe even on a more macro level, you are grieved because of the status of our society. This is the type of mourning that Jesus is talking about, mourning over sin. 
And Jesus says that blessed is the person that mourns, in a sense, that acknowledges spiritual, that acknowledges this spiritual brokenness and acknowledges the spiritual brokenness not just in them, but in the world around them. That doesn't just pretend there's no brokenness, that doesn't just numb their pain and watch Netflix all night, but that is honest and true before God and says, God, I need you. And in a similar sense, going to verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So these are people who are desperate to do right by God. They are desperate to see God reflected in their lives, reflected in their posture, reflected even in their thoughts. And they want to see justice in the broader sense and everywhere. Their personal sin grieves them. The world's sin grieves them. And they can't wait to see evil completely eradicated. Therefore, their appetite is not yet satisfied. They are still hungry to see that righteousness. But Jesus promises that those who mourn and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, he says these people will be comforted and filled. Why? Because one day, they will experience the fruition of their desires. Scripture says that the kingdom of heaven will prevail. We are on the winning side. And there will be a day where all evil will come to an end. And even the evil in us will come to an end, as Revelation 21 describes. You see, for the believer, grief and mourning, grief and mourning is not the destination for the believer. It's the journey towards comfort and renewed life. Amen? Verse 5, it goes on to say this. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And what does it mean to be meek? It means to be unimportant. It means to be insignificant. It means that, I'm sorry to tell you, you are not the guy and you are not the girl. You are overlooked. But Jesus says that these individuals will inherit the earth. That's the promise. In other words, God will raise them up and God will use them. You see, God uses unlikely candidates. So you may feel like you're insignificant. You may feel like, actually, I am just a mess. You may feel like I don't have the credentials. I am not lit. You are the perfect person for God to use. Because we see this all over scripture. David was the youngest of his son. Moses was a stammerer. Rahab was a prostitute. Gideon was the weakest in his clan. Abraham and Sarah were straight up old. <laughs> you know, God uses all ages. <laughs> Peter was a fisherman, Mary was unmarried, and Jesus was from Nazareth. What good can come from Nazareth? But we see that God uses unlikely candidates. Verse 7, we continue. It says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You see, mercy is an act of compassion towards someone who is hurting. As Tim Mackey says, he says, Mercy is a foretaste of the kingdom. And we can see this even in the accounts of Ruth. Ruth supported her mother-in-law, Naomi, who had lost everything. Naomi had lost her husband, and on top of that, she lost her two sons, and she had no prospects for the future. But Ruth, her daughter-in-law, was radically faithful to her. She wouldn't leave her side. She, did, she didn't allow Naomi to fend for herself. And because of Ruth's faithfulness, because of Ruth's um, compassion towards Naomi, she attracted the favor and the compassion from a stranger called Boaz. So we can see, as this promise says, as this blessing says, blessed are the merciful, for they too will be shown mercy. They too will obtain mercy and compassion. Verses 8, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. You see, this refers to an internal posture rather than an external one. I have a nephew called Benji, who is always fighting with my cousin, my young cousin called Emmanuel. And one day they were bickering, they were arguing, and Emmanuel, sorry, Benji said something that was completely out of order. And my oldest sister heard, and my oldest sister, she's a Nigerian mom, so she is, you know, sharp. <laughs> and my oldest sister said, 
Benji, how dare you say that? Apologize right now to Emmanuel. And Benji was like, okay, okay. He was like, Emmanuel, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And he hugged him. And my sister, she was proud. She was like, yes, I'm a good mother. And she now walked away. But the minute that my sister was out of the room, Benji was like, <laughs> You know, and he just started going on and on over Emmanuel. And of course, we know that our inner convictions can be reflected in our actions. But we also know that it is possible to act in a certain way and for your heart to not be in it. And this is what God says to the people of Israel in Joel chapter 2 verse 13. God says to them, render your hearts and not your garments. You see, the people of Israel had this habit. If, they, if they've known they've done something wrong, if, you, if they know they have done dirty, they would, basically, um, they would basically rip their clothes. They would tear their clothes to basically show God that, God, we are so sorry. We apologize for our sins. We, we apologize for our, um, for our rebellion. But the Lord basically knew that they were fake. The Lord basically was like, I don't want a teared, I don't, want, I don't care about your teared clothes. I don't care that you rip your clothes. I want a teared heart. I want a broken and contrite heart. So blessed are those who care about the intentions of their hearts, who move in pure motives, because they will see God. A pure heart is what God is drawn towards. Pure motive is what God favors. Verse 9, it continues. Blessed are the peacemakers. You see, a peacemaker is not just someone who lives in peace. A peacemaker is someone who is intentional in bringing peace and releasing peace to others. This describes an individual that steps in the way, that steps midway of two opposing parties and encourages both sides to drop their conflict, drop their rivalry, drop their accusation, and encourages them to replace evil for good and for forgiveness. And this is what Scripture says that you will be called the children of God. Why? When it says you will, be, you will be called children of God, it essentially means that you resemble, you resemble your father, you resemble um, the one that governs you. Essentially, it is saying that you are someone who represents the heart of God. Why is this? Because Jesus himself stepped in the way. He stepped in the midpoint way to join together humanity and God. Romans says that humanity were enemies to God, but Jesus steps in the way as a mediator and he reconciles humanity back to God. So when someone is a peacemaker, they emulate the heart of Christ. Verse 10. It continues, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I remember in secondary school, sometimes maybe once a week, there would be a school fight that would break out. And there was always a vigilante or a peacemaker that would try to step in and that would try to break up the fight. But what happened? Nine out of ten times, that person was hit as well. That person would be a casualty. <laughs> they tried to do the right thing, but they also came out with a black eye. And I just feel like that is an analogy of righteousness sometimes. That sometimes when you try to step out to defend someone, sometimes when you actually try to reflect the heart of God, Scripture does say that it is possible for there to be um, implications of that. But Scripture promises that your inheritance comes from heaven, that yours is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Let's continue. Finally, it says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed if people ridicule you, torture you for my sake. In other words, rejoice, be happy, because your reward is great in heaven. 
I remember I heard of this um, account of a man who was imprisoned. He was a church leader. He was imprisoned for his faith and he was tortured in prison. And after he was released, he came back to his community. He told his community what had happened and his community started crying. And many people would think that they would cry hearing the story, hearing the account of what happened to their beloved church leader. But they were crying and they were saying, God, would we be worthy enough to suffer just like our church leader did for you? They considered it all joy to see a man suffer for Jesus. On a, less, on a less extreme note, I remember there was a time where a group of friends of mine, they're, they're not Christians, you know, they said to me, they were, they were making fun of me, they were like, wow, Wale, you really love Jesus. And I just started crying and they were like, oh, you know, what did we do? Did we say something out of line? I'm like, no, I'm just so happy. They're like, why? We're making fun of you. I said, but you complimented me. I said, I'm so happy, it's that obvious that I love Jesus. I'm so happy you know where my priorities lie. Glory be to God. <laughs> I was joyful because I know that my, my identity, my joy, my peace, my hope is found in a relationship in Jesus. So it doesn't matter what other people say about me. And often as Christians, especially in the West, we love to avoid persecution. We like to fit in. We might even suppress and try to compromise our faith so others will not reject us, so others will not feel like we are out of order. For example, on a Monday, when people ask you, what did you do? When people ask you in your office, what did you do over the weekend? Many of us say, not much, what about you? Even though on a Sunday we were encountering the living Lord Jesus Christ, even though we were having a, a, a fresh expression, fresh encounters with him, we just say nothing much, you know? And it's one of those things where it's like, okay, we might be afraid to actually declare our faith. And I've definitely felt like that. But the truth is our comfort, our acceptance, shouldn't be our goal. Being comforted and accepted by others shouldn't be our goal. A relationship with God should be our goal. A relationship where we have boundless love, boundless peace, where we get to spend eternity with our Father. And Jesus says that if we live like this, we resemble the prophets of old, the heroes of faith like Elijah and Elisha. And I want to know that all of these different blessings, Jesus isn't presenting a perfect standard for us to aim for. I actually believe that he is simply describing the situations of those who feel like their life is in a mess. He is showing them that good things can still happen even in difficult situations. So just like the great food I found in that one down takeaway place in East London, God's kingdom can be expressed and displayed by lowly people in messed up situations. And it's so amazing that Jesus is speaking to these groups of people who are messed up, these groups of people who are rejected, sick, forgotten by society. Because later on in this chapter, Jesus says to them, to these groups of people, he says to them that you are the salt of the earth, that you are the light of the world, and that you are a city on a hill. It is these messed up groups of people that Jesus starts his revolution, that Jesus decides to use his power and his goodness and bless them so they can manifest his goodness and his kingdom to the rest of the world. He decides to use them out of all people. So if you're struggling with sin, there's good news for you. God can set you free and cleanse you. If you feel overlooked, there's good news for you. God sees you and he wants to use you. 
If you're facing persecution and rejection from others, there's good news for you. This world is not your destination. And one day, evil will be wiped away and God will embrace you into his new life. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news for those who feel like they are losing in life because it is not the end and it is the perfect scenario for us to see more of God. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. I would love to pray, so can we stand?